In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the third Sunday of Toba, and today's Gospel reading uh, deals with the time when the Apostles of Jesus Christ and uh, the Apostles of John the Baptist were both kind of um, on a parallel effort, both baptizing at the same time. And the dispute arose among some of the Jews and the disciples of St. John regarding the topic of purification and the sufficiency of the Old Testament law versus the need for baptism. Why are they even baptizing? So in essence, they were trying to provoke the disciples of St. John by saying, see what value is your master's baptism, St. John, when everyone now is going to Jesus. And their, though their intent was to disprove the need for baptism, and the sufficiency of the law, they accidentally praise and witness to Christ that, of course, everybody was following Christ now. So John's disciples, though, when they were faced with this challenge, they were kind of troubled by this. And they, because they had a lack of understanding and because they lost their peace, and uh, they were challenged. And so they ran to their teacher for healing. They ran to St. John. And they said, look, look what the Jews are saying to us. And scripture um, everywhere tells us that when we lack understanding that's when we're shaken very easily and just like the disciples of St. John for example in Isaiah chapter 3 it says chapter 33 it says wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of our times and the strength of salvation and Hosea says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and many other similar verses that you can find for the scriptures teaching us that we should always strive to understand in greater depth our church, our faith, our belief, our scriptures, and to not just have that superficial or very shallow understanding or life with Christ, but to deepen your relationship with Him and to deepen your understanding as well, so that when we're faced with things, we're not troubled like the disciples of St. John were, were today. Because the two are tied together, spirituality and understanding. As you grow in spirituality, you grow in the depth of your understanding. And as you grow in the depth of your understanding, you also grow in your spirituality. Each one reciprocally produces or, and increases the other. So the disciples of John came to him shaken. But John, as a good and loving teacher, provides a very lengthy response to uh, their struggles and um, and it's always, uh, you know, his response is very full of uh, spiritual benefit and wisdom. So we'll kind of touch on a few of those points. First, he reveals to them that he, he has deep contentment that everyone is going after Christ now. He's very happy about this. He knows the truth of the matter, that Christ is all in all, and that he is but a man sent to be a forerunner for Christ. He notes that a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from above. He sees Christ as the groom. He says he is the groom and the church as the bride. He rejoices that the church is united to the groom and not to himself as only a friend of the groom. So imagine if uh, you're a friend of the groom and the, and the bride comes to you, you're like, no, go to the, go to the groom. You know, be stand next to the groom. So, and and he creates this kind of analogy, which is sprinkled all throughout scriptures that the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Um, so many lessons can be received, of course, from St. John's response. Uh, it's a lesson, uh, for example, uh, to always be content with the things that we cannot change. Um, we should rejoice in the honors given to us by God and not stretch beyond them. If honor doesn't come to us in a certain situation, we should not be troubled by this, but content with understanding that God loves us deeply and beyond words, and he always looks for the opportunity to honor us as is fit. It's a lesson of great, um, of great humility that St. John showed. Knowing the truth of the matter, know, that Christ is who he is and we are who we are, that is humility, is to know the truth of the matter. It's a lesson to place all of our joys and happiness when we come closer to God and when we see others come closer to him too. That's what causes us the joy. And this is something you can ask yourself, and it's a measure of our spirituality. When we come closer to God and when others come closer to God, does that cause us joy? Does that cause us joy like it caused the joy in St. John, uh, John the Baptist? So St. John then, when approached by his friends that were troubled by this challenge, that he gently rebukes them uh, and uh, because they forgot what he's been telling them this whole time about who Christ was. He says, you yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but have sent, been sent before him. Forgetfulness in the spiritual life is a very dangerous thing. 
It's a very dangerous thing. We always have to put in our memories and keep in front of us the things that are important. When we consider, for example, the Israelites, what they went through when they came out of Egypt, they saw the ten plagues, they saw the lightnings and thunders, they saw pillars of fire, uh, they walked through walls of water. And what did they do only just a few days later after witnessing these great events? What did they do? They melted down their gold jewelry and all the other gold they had. They shaped it into a cow and they began to worship it. And they said, this is the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And so that seems kind of, you know, insane, right? Like, how can you have gone from seeing all of these wonders and knowing that it was the God uh, of, our, of your fathers who raised you out of Egypt to only now turn around and go back and worship one of the gods of Egypt, which is this cow. Um, we fall into that same trap. We fall into that same trap when we remind ourselves, when we don't remind ourselves of the much greater wonders that we've witnessed, greater than walking through the Red Sea or the Ten Plagues. The church, of course, aims at reminding us of these mighty acts of God um, that have to do with our salvation, that, has a, that He's accomplished in history, from the icons around the church, to the readings, to the hymns, to the sermon, to the meetings that we have. We remember the actions of our Lord that He accomplished in His ministry and in the saints afterwards. Most importantly, we read scriptures because um, the scriptures are the, the, the repository of memory, of spiritual memory, and we have to always access that. St. John emphasizes that not only is he content, but he's also full of joy. You know, this is where his joy resides, is that when others are going closer to him. He rejoiced greatly and compared his joy to that of a friend of the bridegroom. If you've ever gone to a wedding, uh, and uh, men, if you've been one of those, uh, you know, groomsmen, we rejoice in, in, the, in the bridegroom. Um, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And when we compare the two, rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. And if you ask yourself, which one's harder? Which one requires more spiritual maturity? Which one would you say? The rejoicing or the weeping? Um, our first inclination to answer is usually weeping because nobody wants to weep. but Everybody wants to rejoice. But the truth of the matter is that weeping with those who weep is much easier than rejoicing with those who rejoice. Only the most hardened hearts would not feel some level of sympathy towards those or, that are in some sort of calamity or trouble. But to see another succeed and not feel envy, bitterness, grudging, and not only that but to rejoice is someone with a much more mature mind. Even when we, those who succeed are close to us like family or friends. It's to be God-like and Christ-minded to rejoice with those who rejoice. God loves us and rejoices in our honor and desires to honor us. He took our shame on the cross and clothed us with honor indescribable. Since we're heirs with Christ, He's also giving us everything that belongs to Him. As He says in Revelation chapter 3, To Him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. Which king in the, in the universe or throughout history has ever allowed his subjects to sit on his throne? But our Lord, the King of Kings, allows us to sit on his throne. But it's much more difficult to rejoice with those who rejoice. Think of your own life experiences at work or with family or even in, even in the church sometimes. When one person is held in high esteem or has a success, then immediately that person, the other people are faced with challenges um, you know, with the challenges of jealousy or envy, you know, that's an immediate uh, spiritual warfare that happens. I've seen people even risk their lives for their friends, like put their lives in like physical harm for their friends. But if that same friend receives honor, he automatically receives envy from his, those same friends that were just standing by him, ready to die on his behalf if he's in some trouble. But when uh, when that person is honored, then they re recoil from him. But to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice perfects that bond of peace between everyone else. And it's a very interesting paradox that occurs. The more we share the pain of others, the more the pain decreases. 
and you've seen that in your own life. When you're in pain or you're struggling, if you have somebody there sharing with you, that pain kind of dissolves very quickly. The opposite is true with rejoicing. The more we share in the joy of others, the more the joy spreads and flourishes. And that's a very interesting paradox that occurs. So let us all weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. <clears throat> because in St. John's situation, as we read today, his character is revealed to be more mature because he rejoiced greatly at the increase of Christ, the bridegroom. He could have defended himself. He could have said to his disciples, yes, my disciples, you are right to dispute because my baptism is greater. After all, I baptized Christ. But instead he decreased so that Christ can increase in the sight of men. Thus he revealed the truth of who Christ was. But it can be difficult for us. Instead of rejoicing at the time when others um, uh, are happy, we see envy and sometimes a mad desire for glory. It causes all kinds of evil and problems, not only among friends and family, but on a larger scale among nations and among, even in churches. Envy and you might have seen this, envy can turn churches upside down. So let's stay away from envy and let's rejoice with those who rejoice. St. Basil says that envy is distress caused by your neighbor's prosperity. The jealous person is never free from anguish, never free from despair, and the only cure in his mind is that his fortunate neighbor is deprived of his happiness to become an object of pity. That's the only way he'll be happy. So how do we overcome such a disease called envy or jealousy like St. John the Baptist uh, overcame? St. John Chrysostom gives the answer. He says we should do it by comparing honor versus honor. Has someone come across some money or maybe an inheritance or a new car or some nice house or something like that? We can rejoice with them because we've received greater things. Consider the riches that Christ has given to us, things much more valuable than gold. So when we compare honor with honor, we are content for the things that God has given to us, which are much more precious than gold. Has someone received praise or honor in the sight of other people? Remember that Christ has given us greater honor that more, more than the world can ever dare to even think about giving us. Worldly glory is a name without reality, a name without substance. This, this mm -hmm. phrase called worldly glory. It's a hollow drum. It doesn't contain anything. But the glory of God that He gives us is true and everlasting and attracts praise from angels and archangels and the Lord of archangels. And in the end, it will also give us honor in front of men as well. So many of the Church Fathers has written about envy. St. Cyprian has a wonderful treatise just on this topic. St. Basil the Great does. St. John Chrysostom. A lot of the Desert Fathers speak about envy and many others as well. So St. Basil here gives us some closing advice. When you elevate your mind and fix your attention on what is truly good and praiseworthy, you will be far from beyond thinking that any corruptible or earthly good is a source of happiness or enviable. When you acquire this habit of mind, you will not be obsessed with worldly goods as if they had some great eternal value, and you will find it impossible to feel envy for your neighbor. So may God grant us to recognize the true ugliness of sin and the worldly glory so that he, we may never be envious of others, but always rejoice in our groom, our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.